into chapter 20 here, resistance training concepts. One of the more fun chapters simply because this is the like nuts and bolts, I guess. This is really the backbone to all of the training program models that you're going to create, all the programming that you're going to create, all the periodization that you're going to go through. So taking each of these and going through them step by step, but understanding the principles behind them, understanding the the reasons why you change the adaptations that occur, all that's going to happen here. Not to say that you're not going to get that from the previous stuff like core and strength, uh, speed, agility, and quickness, things like that. So kind of just take each one of these things step by step and really understand how um, we can create, this is the last part of our, besides the cool down, this is the last part of our, our programming concepts. So here we're talking about the um, principles of adaptation, basically saying that obviously the goal here is dependent upon the client, but you know, if, if they're looking for body changes, then aesthetics is the thing. If they're looking for performance based, then we know that that's a whole new different set of parameters that we're going to follow. But resistance training is going to be one of those things that can take you over that edge. It doesn't matter if you're a cardio person, it doesn't matter if you're a power person, a strength person, an endurance, a muscular endurance person. Resistance training can take you and put you into a different category solely than being just specific in one area, one domain. All right, so you can see there, there's, you know, I'm not going to go through all of them with you, but there's the benefits down there in the left corner. Um, you know, of those, we've gone, I, there isn't anything in there that has not been discussed as we've gone through the book. So if you want to pause it, look at it, see what it is, there you go. All right, but if you look on the right hand side here, the adaptation principles. So what we're going to say here is the general adaptation syndrome or gas plus the principle of specificity will make it so that you can adapt, <clears throat> excuse me, to any situation. All right. General adaptation syndrome, that's the three-step process of how our body goes through change. And then the principle of, specif whoa. principle of specificity is that of being specific to what you're training for. So if you're training for upper body strength, you're going to train in an upper body strength way. If you're training for hypertrophy, you're going to train for hypertrophy, lower limb, upper limb, whatever. It's specific to what your goal is, all right? So there's your general adaptation syndrome, or GAS, as, as it's commonly referred to, GAS. There's three phases. <clears throat> and we said this is the way that our body responds to adaptations. Basically, what happens is that if you repeatedly put a stimulus in front of yourself, what's going to end up happening is you're going to get the given response that you're looking for. Why? Because we go through those three phases, like I said last slide, the alarm reaction, resistance development, and then exhaustion. All right, now, each one of them has, has their own specific parameters that we'll go through, but they're more about how your body responds. So the alarm reaction, like it looks right here, what's your reaction of your system? It's that initial reaction. There's fatigue, joint sick, uh, stiffness, and then DOMS. So delayed onset muscular soreness. Pretty much what everybody feels after a training session, right? Now, each one of us responds in a different way. We know as, as future and current professionals that the more trained you are, the less fatigue you would have at the same workout of another person who is less trained. But that does not mean that you as a trained athlete are never going to be tired because your workouts are going to be relative to what your ability is. So therefore, you're still going to have that fatigue, that joint stiffness in the DOMS. And that's how our body reacts. Okay, what ends up happening, we have go we go through that next phase, which is called resistance development. Here, like it says, increase functional capacity to adapt to those stressors. Like it says here, you're going to, you know, increasing the recruitment of muscle fibers. So we're going to develop, we're going to change, we're going to adapt to that situation. And then the exhaustion, this is where we got to be very careful with that term, but I'll talk about the reaction first. So a prolonged intolerable stressor that produces fatigue and leads to injury or a breakdown in the system. Now, in this situation here with exhaustion, what you need to understand is that you can become exhausted 
But if you become exhausted to the point where it goes below your homeostasis line, okay, then what ends up happening is you have this, you have this inability to recover, injury, risk of injury, sickness and disease. So if we looked at it from a search standpoint, um, gas or general adaptation, okay, we type that in and just go into your images, what you're gonna see here is, for example here, just so you can kind of see where we're at, there's your phase one, there's your alarm. See your stress, what ends up happening is you dip down because you're like, oh boy, what's going on here, you know? So then what happens is your body with resistance learns how to cope with that stress. See, if you notice on the left side of the stress resistance, as you put more strain on the body, our body is able to adapt to it. The problem is that when you get into this exhaustive phase, like we said, if there's this homeostasis line right here, if we dip below that, that's where we become too tired, too fatigued, leading to higher levels of injury, leading to potential illness or sickness. I wouldn't go to the fact of disease just yet, but over time, you know, prolonged periods of time of sickness and illness can lead to that disease model as well. So if we do really well with our resistance, we will start to get to that point where our stress resistance stays level and we do not become overly exhausted, but we stay right in that line there. Okay. And that's really the main reason why we, you know, we have those issues of um, sickness and injury risk because of this factor here. Okay. So just kind of, kind of a visual to kind of think about in terms of what is it that we are looking for in, in that regards, okay? So we said, if we go back a couple of slides, general adaptation syndrome over here, okay? And specificity or the said principle, specific adaptations to impose demands is what this, what's SAID stands for. But this principle is basically, again, you put specific demands on the body, the body will start to adapt to it and start making the changes necessary. So where does your specificity come from? What energy systems you're using? We talked about those in the exercise science chapter. What mode of training are you using? What muscle groups and movement patterns are you doing? And is it posturally specific? Okay. All by being that specific in all of those aspects will help us to be able to achieve that goal of that change that we're looking for or that adaptation we're looking for, again, based on the goal of that person. So what we end up with is specificity in different regards. Mechanical specificity, so weight and movements that are placed in the body will be able, you'll be specific in those regards. So when we start talking about the acute variables a little bit deeper, what you end up with is um, uh, you know hypertrophy you're going to have moderate weight moderate reps moderate you know lower types of rest but that's specific to the weight in the in the movements that you're going to do neuromuscular speed of contraction and the exercise selection so the mind body the mind muscle connection or the nerve muscle connection we're talking about spe specificity if you're trying to be an athlete a lot of your speed of contractions are gonna be very rapid. Not all, but a lot of them, okay? If you're trying to do general preparation, then you're gonna to stick to specific tempos. I know that with the muscular or strength endurance phase, it used to be called the muscular endurance phase, the strength, in, the strength endurance phase, with that, the tempo is very, very slow. Four, four seconds, you know, with a two second pause, a one second comeback, and then it's just a quick transition to the next part. So four, two, one, zero, All right? That's a specific speed of contraction. That's a specific tempo. Metabolic spe uh, specificity goes back to the first one there, specificity of energy system. What are you working in? Are you trying to be more aerobic? Are you trying to be more anaerobic? Are you trying to restore ATP quicker? Is there a way that you can do an in-between to help both? All right, is there more of a hybrid base? Can we work on different ways like interval sprinting, like in our zone training of cardio? You know, that's aim, you know, that can help with both our aerobic and anaerobic aspects. So, you know, there you can see how we can start being a lot more specific and trying to get to hit the goals that we need to and apply the specific adaptations that are needed. Okay. 
So again, with, with the phases, if you notice there, there they are, stabilization, muscular endurance, uh, muscular hypertrophy, strength and power. Now just remember here, this, you know, with the way that, whoops, with the way that we look at everything, strength, endurance, that's at phase two, okay? But st stabilization, what is it? What are the adaptations we're looking for? Optimal dynamic joint support, dynamic with movement, optimal in movement support of joints to help our posture and to help our posture with movement. Muscular endurance, repeated contraction, produce and maintain forces produced for prolonged periods of time. You've already stabilized the joints. You have proper posture, proper form. So now we're going to put that into a lot more force aspect, but doing it repeatedly for longer bouts. Another phase, phase three, we talked about is muscular hypertrophy or the growth or the enlargement of skeletal muscle fibers. And that there is more of that aesthetic feel. Now, does that mean that you know, hypertrophy isn't important for an athlete or an elderly person? No, that, that, that definitely doesn't mean that. What I'm saying here is that if, you know, a bodybuilder is the true epitome of what hypertrophy is about, but we don't undervalue that for somebody like a football player or like I said, an, a senior or just a general population person, you know? So that's where it becomes critical. Strength, so overcoming an, an external high, high, heavy external load for one bout, okay? That's truly about strength. But strength in general could mean a little bit more than that, but it's really, you know, the production of internal tension to overcome external load. So if you have a 315 pound barbell and you're gonna do a deadlift, right? You have to provide more than 315 pounds of internal load for that barbell to move off the ground. If you meet the demands of the bar, meeting the demands, meaning that you only can produce 315 pounds off that bar, obviously we have to create more internal tension because of the mechanics of our body. But ultimately, if you look at it from that standpoint, if you can, if you cannot internally overcome the, or you match the 315 at that bar, that bar is just going to stay on the ground. So you're going to end up doing an isometric pull. So you have to be able to go higher than that 315 to be able to be able to pull that off the ground. Power, power is a combination of force times velocity. Okay. Divided by time, All right? Force times velocity. Um, or what force times velocity is actually called work divided by time. So it's F times V divided by T. All right, now power, very explosive, being able to generate force very quickly and overcome high, level, high loads, low loads, whatever it may be, okay? So on this page, one thing that I really wanted to address, and I think sometimes we have to be aware of it, is the hypertrophy and strength aspects. One of the things that I relay to my students a lot is that hypertrophy and strength, although seem similar, vastly different. And the main way that you have to look at it is if you're looking to, add a, uh, to have adaptations in hypertrophy, understand that depending upon your level of performance, meaning if you're more advanced or less advanced, it may not necessarily have a direct influence on your strength. Now, if you're newer, it can. But if you're more advanced, usually if you're if you're training for hypertrophy, you're you're usually not going to be training to enhance your strength. So hypertrophy does not equal strength. On the other hand, if you're training in a strength realm, there has been research that does show that even though you're going to be using less volume that usually is needed for hypertrophy, strength can offset and create growth of muscle fibers. So strength can equal hypertrophy. But understand that they don't work in both ways. Just because you're training to grow muscles doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to improve your one rep max. Now, in some, in some situations, some cases, it, it can, but for majority, not going to happen. Okay, so just kind of keep that in your back pocket. 
So there's your acute variables. These are the things that we're going to be using to help us to optimize our, our resistance training aspects. So reps, sets, intensity, tempo, rest intervals, training volume, training frequency, training duration, selection of exercises, and order of exercise. Now, training intensity, just remember, training intensity also relates to weight lifted. Okay, but these are our acute variables that will match us to how we're going to set up our people for their exercise program. So reps, all right, repetition categorize, you know, what, you know, categoriz categorization of them is more important at this point, but it's just the number of times you complete that exercise. Low rep range, one to five. Moderate, six to 12. High, 12 or higher. So you can see here how we can start labeling it for them depending upon what discipline they're in, all right? The other thing, before I go on, let's just kind of break this down a little bit. But up top here, if you follow my mouse, bodybuilding, powerlifting, Olympic weightlifting, strength and conditioning, and physical therapy. Okay? Some, some individuals like to categorize all of these in, in specific ways. But understand that there's a vast difference between them. Bodybuilding. Bodybuilding is for hypertrophy, for muscle growth, for on-stage performance, or for aesthetic purposes, okay? Powerlifting. Powerlifting is feats of strength or max strength. Typically with powerlifters, they work solely within, especially competition. Now, you can powerlift inside of a gym, but for competition purposes, powerlifting includes the bench press, the deadlift, and the back squat, okay? That's separate, and then that's where if you're training as a power lifter or training like a power lifter, you're gonna be focusing on those three aspects plus other accessory work that goes along with it. Olympic weightlifting, clean and jerk, and snatch. And then everything else would be considered accessories like back squats, front squats, overhead squats, pulls. That's the difference there. Strength and conditioning is, to me, strength and conditioning incorporates power lifting, Olympic weightlifting, maybe a little bit of bodybuilding, and then includes the conditioning part of everything, including your more sport-specific bases, so training like a baseball player, training like a basketball player, hockey player, football player, et cetera, and that conditioning component. So we're going to be doing sprint-based things, long-duration things, you know, depending upon the sport. So it, the conditioning component is what sets apart you know, but it incorporates that powerlifting and Olympic lifting base. And then physical therapy, more or less physical therapy is rehabilitation. You're not going to really include, a, I mean, are there some strength and conditioning techniques that could be used in physical therapy? Yes, but not to that higher level. So that's where I want to just make sure that you understand that there are more disciplines than that. But, you know, a lot of times those other disciplines that we hear of, they incorporate all of those five there that work. Okay, so sorry to kind of get off on that soapbox, but um, I wanted to hit that before we kept going farther. So sets, reps is the number of times exercise performed. Sets, we're talking about um, consecutive repetitions to create one full set. Okay, there's an inverse relationship between sets, reps, and intensity. So the bottom line here is if we did lighter weight, we're going to do fewer sets, but higher reps. With heavier weight, we're gonna do more sets, lower reps. So lighter weight, more of that stabilization, more of that um, you know, uh, strength endurance, muscular endurance. Heavier weight, you're looking more at a little bit more of the bottom end of the hypertrophy base. You're looking more at strength base, power base. All right, so those are there. And then your intensities, it's usually, it's the effort that is given you know, compared to your maximal effort. So if you're looking at it, if you look at that bottom piece there, percentage of your one repetition max. So if you're trying to achieve a new one rep max or rep one repetition max, what you're doing is you're actually trying to work on those specifics for trying to achieve the highest weight lifted in that one time. If you do, that's your new 100%. And then everything else that you do in relationship to that lift is based off of that percentage. Okay, so that's percentage-based training at its finest. All right, so there, here are your variables and what we just talked about, reps, sets, and intensities. You can look here a little bit you know, more clear. 
All right, they're broken down a little bit more. I'm not gonna go through each one piece by piece, but take a look at them, see where you're at, because I'll show you the true chart later on. And actually, we'll probably do a secondary video, follow-up video to this to kind of break down each one of those phases. Rep tempo, so it's the speed at which you perform. Okay, if you notice the slower is gonna be stimulating more of that hypertrophy, the stabilization and the endurance, like I said before, faster strength and power. Oh, that, so there you go. There's that four, two, one, one tempo I was talking about earlier. You know, the lowering, the, so the first number is always your lowering or your eccentric action. The second is the pause, okay, isometric contraction. The pushing upward and returning to the top position is a one second uh, concentric. And then the, the second one is a one second pause between each rep, all right? So there, you know, here if you looked, a barbell bicep curl using a 3012 tempo. All right, we're talking about curling it for one second. So if we started from that resting position, we curl it up for one second, pause at the top for two, lower it for three. And then you saw the zero. The zero means that you're going to go into, um, there's no pause. So it's three seconds. Okay, three seconds of a eccentric, there's no pause at the top. So you're just gonna bring it right back down one second of contraction and then two seconds of pause before you do it again. All right, so it's a little bit different, a little bit different there, all right? Rest intervals, they're gonna vary depending upon what you're doing. If you notice maximal strength and power are looking at three to five minutes, that is to help with to avoid excessive muscular fatigue, but also it's to make sure that we have complete resynthesis of ATP, all right? That's why it usually is a little bit longer there. Stabilization, muscular endurance, muscle hypertrophy, 30 to 60 seconds or lower, depending upon what you're doing. Um, you know, you might see that the stabilization of muscular endurance might say zero seconds, which means you're just gonna go from one to another to another, almost like in a circuit form, but time to recover between sets. Training volume, all right, reps times sets times weight. Sometimes you might see it as reps times sets only. All right, so it just depends on what you're trying to find. Are you trying to find overall volume, which is usually reps times sets? Are you trying to find how much tonnage or pounds that they lifted in one session that might dictate how to you know, move on to the next session or the next day? That would be reps times sets times weight. Frequency, now that's, that's the chart there on the right, but if you notice a beginner two to three days of resistance training, that's pretty standard. Intermediate, three for total body, four if you're using a split method where you're gonna do different muscle groups on different days, and then advance four to six, okay? Um, also understand that you, know, you might have um, more than one session in a day if you're advanced. So like two a days, three a days, depending upon your level and what you're trying to achieve. Training duration, how long is the training session lasting? 30 to 90 minutes, that's pretty standard. If you're going over 90 minutes in a training session, then there has to be a reason for that, all right? Um, doesn't mean that you know spending more than an hour and a half in, in the gym is inappropriate, but you know, if you looked at time management wise, are, you know, for what you're doing, if you're going over an hour and a half, like I said, there needs to usually be a little bit more specificity in what you're doing. And again, there's always outliers. So there's always people there that are going to be there that are doing extra stuff and, and, you know, but there's a reason for it. Now, exercise selection is really important because it goes by a lot of different factors like goals, your fitness level, your ability. Uh, assessment results can even come into play there. But really what we want to think of is large muscle groups before small muscle groups and multi-joint or compound exercises prior to single joint or isolation exercises. Very important on that. Now, exercise order, it's, you know, like it says here, there's two different types of methods. Method one is arranging them based on priority um, and what your goals are. Okay, so like it says there, they give you the example of like a fatigue level and a clientability. So you might pick a, an exercise order that will help them so they don't fatigue out too quick early on. And then later on, as they get closer to the end, they can fatigue out. Or you arrange them by the type of exercise. Like it says, multi-joint, then single joint. So the example of that, let's say that you were doing a split routine and 
you wanted to do, um, you know, you were going to work on quads, you know, quads were going to be your main focus for the day and you're splitting it and, and only doing quads on that day. Multi-joint wise, you might consider doing a barbell back squat or a front squat or some, some squatting motion that's, you know, free weight based and you can use, you know, a leg press if you wanted to, things like that. But multi-joint, you're using more than one joint. Then what you'll do is you might go into some isolation work where you might do some knee extensions, right? Seated knee extensions. Maybe you're going to do some, you know, and, and then you can kind of be a little bit more open to that. Maybe you're going to push those back and maybe the next thing you're going to do after your back squat or your front squat or whatever you're going to choose, maybe you're going to do some stationary um, dumbbell split squats or stationary, you know, just staying in that and just doing like a stationary lunge basically. Well, there you're using your hips, your knees and your ankles as well. So multi-joint, multi-joint, then you might consider going into, like I said, the knee extensions. So that's just another way to kind of arrange it, but you get the gist of how that can go. So there's other training systems that come up. There's a war there's warm up sets. You know, that's kind of exact, you know, you don't want to be the, the, the typical person in the gym that we see, or you don't want to train your people like the people that walk into the box gyms and they, they go over the bench press and what do they do? They throw on, you know, 135 pounds and they warm up and they do 10, 10 reps and then they, they rack it and then they put 25s on and now you got 185 and what ends up happening? They only could do five. It's like, well, you definitely can't do you know, if you can only do five at 185, your next set is maybe going to be 195, 205, where you can get some decent amount of reps in there. But you you didn't build up at all. You didn't take the time to do what you needed to do. So warm up sets are critical. You know, they're lower intensity. They're meant to be able to just get you what you need to then move on to your next ones. Single set system is exactly what it sounds like. One set per exercise, move on. Multiple set system, exactly what it sounds like. Multiple number of sets for each exercise and then you move on. Or you do one set, one set, one set, one set, and then come back to the top almost like a circuit base. You, you know, depend, so either horizontal basically or vertical loading at that point. Pyramid system, increasing or decreasing in weight. So you can, it truly looks like a pyramid. Superset where you do two exercises back to back with minimal rest. It can be complementary or it can be non-complementary. So you can either do opposing muscle groups supersets or you can do same muscle group supersets. Okay. A complex training, like it says here, performing a multi or compound exercise with a heavy load followed by an explosive movement. So you're talking about doing a, a max strength effort followed by power base. All right. Um, definitely consider having more rest in between because it does really burn out your nervous system to do that because you go into that you know you basically go into that explosive movement kind of pre-fatigued but still doable drop sets basically what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to go until failure drop a small amount of weight and then do it until failure again very very um very well used in the uh bodybuilding world um, more for hypertrophy based, more so than anything else. Giant sets for more exercises with as little rest in between. All right, not a circuit, but you're, you're doing, you know, four, five, six exercises in a row. Kind of like, it, it's kind of like a really big superset, if you want to consider it, really a long superset because you're doing more than one exercise. A rest pause set, all right, slight pause between reps with a series of sets. So rest, pause, set, okay? So, I, so at each rep has a pause in it, so a little bit slower of a movement. Circuits we've already touched on, um, where you're gonna go exercise back to back to back with minimal rest, then rest at the end, and then start that circuit over again. Obviously, the amount of times you do the circuit is dependent upon how you, um, your, your ability level, how well you wanna do that. Peripheral action system, like I said, it's a variation that you alternate between upper, lower, upper, lower. So circuit can be any way you want to put it. Peripheral is it's uh, the periphery, all right? So high, uh, higher, lower, higher, lower, and splitting between them. Split routine systems are where you actually split the body up into body parts and you split it up so that you can do those body parts on specific days. 
Um, to be perfectly honest with you, when I was uh, using the NASM model very regularly, um, what I was finding was that I could basically split my routine up any way I wanted to. There were days where I was doing biceps and quads in the same day, you know, and people were looking at you like, what? But it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's dependent upon what you want to do, right? There's nobody says that you can or cannot do it that way as long as it makes sense for the rest of the time. Like I'm not going to do quads and biceps in the same day. And then the following day I'm going to do um, another set of backs, you know, it just, it depends because you're burning out those systems. You've got to give it a little bit of rest. So, you know, you have to make sure the sequencing is correct still. That's why the programming aspect is really important. Vertical loading kind of hit on this term before, but you're going to go vertical up and down, which means if you look at your program, you're going to start at the top and go down one set of everything and then start back at the top again. And if you notice there, total body, chest, back, shoulders, biceps, triceps, legs, and then you start back at the top again. Horizontal means that you're going to take that total body and do all the sets. Rest, you know, rest in between, all that good stuff. Then move on to chest, do all the sets, move on, back, move on. All right, so it just depends on what you're, what you're attempting to do there. All right, horizontal loading, um, a little bit more common in the weightlifting world where you're usually going to complete all the sets before you move on to the next exercise. So there's your pyramid system, just a good way to kind of see it in you know, light to heavy, heavy to light. There isn't one, or one right or wrong way with this. It just means that one way is gonna be more of a buildup um, to a heavier base, one's heavier moving down to a lighter base. The only difference with this though is that you have to be very critical about your, your heavy to light because you have to make sure that you have a really, really adequate warm up that hits enough weight before you start on your very first set that's heavy because if you don't and you're going to go right into your first heavy you know you're only setting yourself up for injury there is that example of your circuit training you know moving from one to another to another there's your peripheral heart action upper dumbbell and chest press lower dumbbell squat upper machine row lower romanian deadlift upper dumbbell shoulder press that's just again upper lower upper lower you know, moving, up, you know, from different periphery. There's your split routine, pretty good way of how you break it down. You know, each person does it differently, but these are really common methods that we use depending upon how many days you train throughout the week on these in particular, okay? Vertical loading, like I said, complete that before moving on to the next, complete all of them before moving on to the next set, uh, you know, next set of each one. Horizontal, complete one exercise, one exercise base, and then move on to the next. So the main thing here that we want to understand is that there's a safety component to it. All right. Obviously, maintaining safe environment, proper equipment setup, all those things are really important. And, you know, one of the things that I always thought was important to understand is that as a trainer, my goal was always to be able to get people to come to me and then be able to say, oh, you know what? I don't want to see you here in six months. I want you to be doing this on your own. And then if you need my assistance, you know, I'll try to help you any way I can. Okay. Um, so that was one of the things. So this is where this aspect of safety comes in because in the process of me trying to, you know, have them be able to be more independent and move on their own, we have to talk about safety. We have to talk about proper execution, proper equipment setup, all of that good stuff so that they can eventually do it on their own where they feel comfortable and they don't feel so scared, all right, or have that fear that might be within them. So this is where the, that aspect comes in. But yeah, that was one of the things that I always was explaining to them. Like, I'd rather see you do this on your own because it means that now you have it ingrained in your mind where you don't have to be relying upon me. But these are parts of things that we have to understand. We have to be able to teach and educate. We have to be able to show them what safety is all about. All right. Spotting techniques. Spotting techniques are really important. It depends on what you're doing. It may require you as a trainer, as a coach, depending upon what you're going to do, um, to call upon other people to help you in this term. Now, this is a two-person spotting because they're spotting from both sides. If you notice the picture, typically in this sake, I would I would say, you know, if I was the person in charge, I would try to get one more person in there. I'd rather have three people 
if it was that heavy of a load, simply because the fact that a person behind the lifter can, can dictate and control everything because sometimes the lifter is so focused on lifting that you don't want to have to have them worry about spotting when you as the experienced person can do it for them and take that scared factor away from them as well. And then have two people that are understanding of the right spotting way to be helping you as well. But yeah, spotting is definitely, you know, watch videos on how the correct spotting is. I'm sorry, but you know, when you're spotting a back squat, you know, one of the things that we have to understand is we have to be right directly behind that person. We have to have that leverage to basically squat them up with the bar so that they can, you know, finish the lift if they're starting to get tired. But you have to be close to that person. You can't feel uncomfortable in that sense. It's like, no, you got to be there because the spotter has to be the person who is helping. They, they are there to avoid that injury component. So that's really, 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 really critical for that. Um, one of the things that I do see here on the bottom, though, recommended for uh, fitness professionals to um, not spot during like machine based. Right. That is true because the machine is there to do the spotting. Is there so, like if you're doing like a seated chest press with a with a machine, can you help that person maybe pull up a little bit on the bar? Yeah, but more times than not, you're going to avoid that now they go a little bit ridiculous here and saying placing hands underneath the weight stack you would never do that that's just let's not sugarcoat words but that's asinine um so we have to be aware of that but yeah if you're going to spot you can spot from different areas it's just you do it in a way that if it was just like a free weight but you don't want to upset the machine so you know, we have all of this, but how do we monitor? We've talked about the RPE before and, and your rating of perceived exertion on a scale of zero to 10, how do you feel? Well, if you're training and you feel like you're running an eight, nine or 10, then we gotta be very careful as to, okay, how much more are we really gonna have this person do if not stop, okay? Or really it's more about knowing when to tell them that they're done because they can't go on anymore or do we drop the load? That's always a questionable aspect as well because they're fatigued and even a lightweight can really affect them in some manner. Just like anything else, we're always gonna make sure that with the safety part, with the proper technique and posture part, feet, knees, hips, shoulders, and head are always our checkpoints even when we're doing things like lifting. It's gonna be very important. It's important during cardio. It's important during SAQ drills. It's important during explosive training during core based. So all of that makes a big difference. So it's no different here. So breathing technique, understanding, you know, how to breathe in, breathe out, right? When to hold, when not to hold. So this is the, the part of safety that can become misconstrued as well as this Valsalva maneuver. Holding of the breath that basically can cause you to have, you know, higher levels of intra-abdominal pressure. It's gonna create a higher level of spinal stability because what it does is it, when you hold your breath in, if you take a good diaphragm breath and it locks in your abs, it's gonna help that hollow area that doesn't have any um, major attachment from below the ribs to the hips, it's empty there. You know, there's muscle, but there's really nothing there except for the spine that's supporting your body. So when you use the Valsalva maneuver and, and, and lower and basically flatten out the diaphragm, it causes the intercostals to, to get engaged. It causes the abdominal region to become engaged and creates like a weight belt. That helps, but you have to be aware that proper breathing will only help you to avoid having the Valsalva maneuver turn bad, okay? Now, when you hold your breath, it is gonna increase internal pressure. Therefore, when you let your breath out, it's really important. That's why under like a heavy load, I'm sure a lot of you have felt this before where you start getting lightheaded or dizzy, that's because you were breathing effectively, but you might, you know, the, it just was so much built up internal pressure that it's causing you to feel that sort of way, seeing stars, things like that, All right? So depending upon what you're trying to achieve, we have to work on proper breathing. Now, can, do we need to make sure that a beginner, a beginner might not need to, but you know, they still need to understand the right breathing and maybe not having to hold as hard as they need to. 
So that's also important as well. So here's your guidelines. You've seen these before, but progressive, you know, easy to hard, simple to complex, known to unknown, um, static to dynamic, slow to fast, all right? All those things come into play. Full range of motion. You know, wh what are we talking about? Anything from full to mixed ranges. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the called 21s or 7s. You're doing seven at the really low end of the of the lift, doing seven at the middle range, and then you're doing or the upper range, and then you're doing seven all the way through. Um, that that can use end ranges, it can use partial and full ranges as well. So it's very important to think about that. Speed, slow to explosive, volumes you can adjust. We talked about that. Planes of motion, always using different planes of motion will enhance the total body doesn't matter what sport you're in or what way of lifting you're doing, what mode, it doesn't matter, it's always there. And then obviously with resistance, it could be anything from body weight like a pull up all the way to heavy, heavy weights like deadlifting and squatting and benching, clean and jerk snatch, all of those good things. All right, so again, pattern wise, squatting, pushing, vertical pressing, hip hinging, all those are gonna be needed to make sure we have ideal movement patterns to be able to focus in on a lot of the main lifts that we do, all right? So then what do we do? We look at, well, we're gonna use those, but we're gonna use them either a stabilization focus, a strength focus, or a power focus base. And that, that goes right off of the OPT model. So stabilization focus, if you notice here, this person is just, you know, now we're looking at it from, you know, one or two sided, you know, if you look at the person on the left, or the same person on the left doing double, person on the, in the middle is doing, um, you know, they're doing uh, opposite, so they're doing unilateral. So that's really important as well. They can do it more stabilized with single leg rowing, right? We can also do Things like earthquake bars, which if you've ever used one of those before, very, very challenging, but it's stable because that bar is gonna be moving. So that means you have to be more under control. If you notice there, we call those top, top up kettlebell presses. Um, that's on the right hand side here. Yeah, those are, are uh, bottom up, excuse me, bottom up exercises where we, you know, the bell has a lot more um, maneuverability so it wants to move in that hand so we're stabiliz stabilizing the kettlebell for that bottom-up approach to be able to press. Strength focus, there's your back squat, there's your deadlift, and you know start to finish, there's your bench press. Um, you know obviously there's pressing overhead, there's you know other formats that we can use to help with our strength focus. But again strength and hypertrophy are key there. Power focus, again, increased rate of force production, so speed plus strength, trying to move something very, some trying to move a load very quickly is what we really want to consider. So medicine ball throws, plyometrics, all those are make a big difference. Again, not just athletic based. So here they give you some total body stuff from stabilization all the way to complete strength and power, all right? And then what you can do is take these, these lists and you can re, um, revert to your text, your manual, your textbook, and you can look at each one of these to see exactly what they do and what they entail. So you can kind of match the name to what you're doing, unless you already kind of have an idea. There's your pushings, your push-ups, your push-ups with a ball. So again, going from stabilization to explosive. There's your pulling, again, same thing. Stabilization, ball, cobras, all the way to your soccer throw is being more of that plyometric explosive base. And then vertical pressing, so more up and down. All right, going again from a stabilization to um, overhead medicine ball throws, which is more power based. Biceps, triceps, leg exercises. So you can pause each one of these areas so you can see what you have to offer in those realms. And if you're like, well, I don't really know what that is. Again, go back into that, into your text, go to the appendix in the back that has all the exercises and match it up to these. And you'll see exactly what it is and how to do it. And then best bet from there, practice it. 
look at instructional videos on how to complete that exercise correctly if you're kind of struggling a little bit. Record yourself and see where your form is, and then that will only help you to get better at, number one, explaining these movements to people, but also demonstration purposes as well. All right, so that's resistance training. That's exactly what we're looking for there. It's exactly what we wanna find when it comes to how do we start progressing because the next chapter, chapter 21, is how do we take everything that we just learned, starting all the way back at the flexibility chapter, moving all the way through to our chapter 20 here, resistance training, and how do we put this together to make the best possible exercise programming we can. So chapter 21, again, more periodization based. Um, it's more diving into the OPT model. So um, it's really cool because it, it's, that's also really cool to, to know that because that's actually the chapter that I was lucky enough to be able to write on. So I, I wrote this chapter for the textbook. So really cool to be able to give that that lecture based on something that I wrote myself so not I'm not a t horn tutor but that's just it's really cool to be able to do so um, take everything in here in stride and move on and we'll see how we put it all together in the next chapter have a great day